As a way of focusing our discussion on Christology during this session, I'm going to focus on the work of a theologian I've particularly been interested in over the last years, Jürgen Moltmann. He was the subject of my dissertation, and I was was able to meet with him over the years, and he's been a friend in different ways, a support as I've journeyed through theology. So when I talk about his Christology, it's not only as a removed observer, but someone who has seen how his Christology takes shape in his own life and being able to ask questions about that and dig deeper. So if I'm going to talk about a particular theologian, this is uh, among the ones that I am particularly specialized in. So hopefully it will be helpful. It's also true that Christology for Montmont takes a different shape than it has for uh, much of conventional theology. As he's explored theology in light of his own story and experiences, he's deepened and broadened the discussion beyond just the issue the philosophical issues of uh, Jesus's hu humanity and divinity and the traditional topics and pushed the conversation towards his life. And as that's the focus of this week, it's important. He's also emphasized the cross in a renewing way that it helps spark conversations throughout the world. In fact, his work on Christology, The Crucified God, was one of the key books, along with Theology of Hope, that helped spark liberation theology discussions around the world. So while he is located in Germany, at the one of the central places of theological thought of the last 150 years in Tübingen. His theology isn't limited to that and has been developed in many different ways in many different places in many different languages. And so having an understanding of Moltmann's Christology, even in an introductory sense, can help give insight to how these conversations are taking shape elsewhere. First, we look at himself. Who is Jürgen Moltmann? He was a German, as I mentioned, who was born in the late 1920s. And as such, he was raised in the shadow of Nazi regime, Adolf Hitler. He was, his, his family were not Nazis, but uh, if you were living in that era, it was inescapable. Both the influence of the kind of government and also being uh, conscripted into the service. And so he was drafted as a 16-year-old early in World War II, along with his best friends, they were to man a anti-aircraft battery in the, his hometown of Hamburg. And for a while, it was, it was a very uh, easy assignment. And then what was called Operation Gomorrah started. One night, the British bombers came in and dropped foil down first to, hide, to, dis to confuse the radar and then proceeded to drop incendiary bombs on the city, creating a firestorm. It was one of the methods they used to not only destroy major industrial centers, but also to attempt to strike at the morale of those in the city to turn against the war. And Moltmann at this anti-aircraft battery was in the midst of it. A bomb went off at his battery. He was saved, wasn't hurt, but he watched his best friend killed right in front of him. And he then carried on. It wasn't a matter of choice. He, he was later sent to the front in Belgium where he f fought. And he, as he calls himself, he was a very bad soldier. And he was captured and sent to a prisoner of war camp. While there, that's where he learned about the atrocities the Germans were committing against Jews and others. And it was also there that he says he met God. So as part of his theology, he shares his story as part of his journey in wrestling with topics. He emphasizes the importance of experience for theology and Christology. His book on theological method is called Experiences in Theology. We can't divorce our experiences from our discussion of God because we can't divorce our experiences from our encounter with God. God works in historical settings and that is true even in our own lives and how we react. To it. So how do we in our experiences come to terms with who God is? For him, it was a attempt to encounter God in light of the Holocaust. Where is God in Auschwitz was the key question to his crucified God. His theology of hope 
his first major work came out of his attempt to find a way to talk about God in light of the destruction of the 20th century. Throughout his works, he emphasizes the importance of ecumenical and intercultural engagement. He's not – he's a reformed theologian. That's his background and draws deeply from that well. His dissertation was in early Reformation reformed uh, theology, particularly a Huguenot, a French Calvinist scholar. And yet then he has since continued to broaden and deepen, moving more in towards constructive theology rather than historical theology very early in his career, drawing from resources as many as he could find. And so now you only loosely would call him a reformed theologian. He draws from that, and yet he is, he's certainly not narrow in that way. And he listens and draws from cultures throughout the world as his works have gone around the world. He's often invited to go speak and has learned and expanded his thought because of this. His main Christological work is called The Way of Jesus Christ, published in 1987. It's one of the six volumes which are called Contributions to Theology. Different than most systematic theologies, Moltmann's tried to write a dynamic and narrative approach in his Christology. He talks about Jesus Christ being on the way to his messianic future, Christ in his becoming, the experience of Christ walking down this path. He reflects on the main movements on the way, namely the earthly mission, the cross, the resurrection, the present cosmic rule, and the parousia, Jesus' return. And in this, you can already see that these elements are expanding on while including the traditional discussions. As we go forward, it would be helpful to hear in his own words, his response to his own story and his response and approach to especially Jesus. Who is God for you? Jesus Christ is a human face of God. And uh, without Jesus Christ, I would not believe in God. Looking at the catastrophes of nature and the human catastrophes of history, I would not uh, come off the, uh, on the idea that a God exists and this God is love. This was unthinkable for me. As the but with Jesus Christ and his message and his suffering on the cross and his resurrection from the cross, uh, my feeling that God is present in the midst of suffering is uh, a firm trust of my heart. So you're not speaking right now <coughs> simply as a theologian. You're speaking from personal experience of yeah. discovering or being discovered by God. Yeah. When you were, can you say more about this experience? Well, when, uh, which, was, which was experience of anxiety, uh, aftermath of terror, uh, a place where joy normally would not uh, find its uh, entrance. Well, when, when I was 16, I was drafted to the German army in 1943 and uh, experienced the destruction of my hometown, Hamburg. Uh, at the, in the midst of Hamburg, there was an anti-aircraft battery and we uh, schoolboys had to serve in this battery and uh, where the operation called by the British was the operation Gomorra, the destruction of the sinful city of Hamburg and I was in the midst of it and at that time I cried out to God for the first time. Uh, and later I uh, was in prison, uh, in a prison camp in Scotland and uh, there I read with consciousness for the first time the Gospel of Mark and when I came to the uh, cry with uh, 
which Jesus died, my God, why has so forsaken me? I felt that there is a divine brother who feels the same as my feeling was at that time. And uh, this uh, saved me from self-destruction mm -hmm. and uh, desperation. And so uh, I came up with hope on a place where there was no expectation to come home soon. Uh, we, we were, the imprisonment lasted for three years. He could certainly say more, but even in that, you could see his heart as he enters into these discussions is not purely a theoretical or academic, but it is the cry of his heart and the journey that has driven him throughout his career. And certainly that passion resonates through his work. It's that passion and willingness to engage the difficult questions that resonated with me when I was doing my, doing my MDiv studies and continue to be not only academic, very rich in deep theology, but was continues to be devotional reading as we, we see how he makes these connections with the heart of who God is and trying to find the words and language that can communicate to questions and issues. So unlike many theologians, creeds, Moltmann is intentional about paying close due attention to Jesus' earthly ministry because it is here we see how he responded to issues of suffering. If we only look at certain elements, it's very easy to take these outside of our experiences and in doing that, make Christianity more of a theology of something out there or something that happens purely in heaven and whatever happens here on earth is accidental. But that's very much not what God's intent was. God reaches into this earth. And as he reaches into this earth, we see God's personality, reality, his response to others as not a theory, but as a true living theology in every way. Boltman also emphasizes the Holy Spirit as part of his works. In fact, in as you read his theology, there's this growing sense of the importance of the Spirit that had been missing from a lot of traditional theology, especially in the West, where theology had developed in, in ways that would acknowledge the Spirit's presence but didn't have a lot to say because this pneumatology was folded into other doctrines. But Moltmann began to see as he wrote his works increasingly how we have to really see the Spirit as a distinct person. And as a distinct pneumatology can't be folded into other topics because a distinct pneumatology shapes those other topics, the Holy Spirit should be a primary focus for us with the Father and with the Son, all three. Primary and everything else folds into that. But if we put the Spirit off the side, we undermine the Trinity, essentially, and have a non-Trinitarian approach to theology effectively, even if our, we, we wouldn't say that out loud. So he sees, especially in this book, and then develops even further in his book, The Spirit of Life, which came out of this rising impulse. He saw he had a need, he had a need to write a book specifically about the Spirit. He sees the Spirit Christology is central to understanding what the Messianic mission is in light of Jesus. He writes, Jesus' history as a Christ does not begin with Jesus himself. It begins with the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. It is in the coming of the Spirit, the creative breath of God. In this, Jesus comes forward as the anointed one, Messiah, Christos, proclaims the gospel of the kingdom with power and convinces many with the signs of the new covenant. So in his earthly ministry, we see Christ being born of the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit that inaugurates his mission, ministers in the Spirit, offers his life to the Spirit, and is raised up to a new life in the Spirit. If the Spirit, we say, is the Spirit of life, then how is it Jesus is resurrected? The Spirit is continuing to work and bringing forth Jesus from death, just as he brought Jesus forth into life. Thus, Moltmann speaks of a pneumatological Christology in the power of the Spirit, he writes.
Jesus inaugurates the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is manifested in Jesus' earthly life in parables, healings, and companionship, particularly with the poor and children and other outcasts, and in the gospel of freedom, setting the captives free, as well as in peacemaking. Now, as we look at the life of Jesus in this way, we see how this mission isn't about a salvation that's out there or up ahead. It's a salvation that's lived and experiences in the lives of those who encounter Jesus in the now as well. It's not just the now, but it includes the now as a way of expressing this fuller sense of God's work. In his Christology, he also emphasizes the cross of Christ and the death of God. Moltmann calls Jesus' suffering the apocalyptic sufferings of Christ. Suffering is the crucial question about God. If God cannot suffer, it would make him less than human, who does suffer. This experience of suffering gives insight and orientation towards others in relationship. So instead of the apathy of God, which is, was emphasized as part of the classical theism, we need to speak of theopathy, the God who suffers, who experiences suffering. Now, this is where it's different. It's not that it's saying God is somehow broken or a victim. It's that God's encounter with, su with suffering is still real and true, but God offers this transformation. In love, there's an experience of suffering when, when the one who is loved is hurting. How do you feel? If the one who is loved betrays you, how do you feel? If someone you loved was horribly hurt or, or, or betrayed you and you had no reaction, is that love? That's a key question in Moltmann's work. So much so is this true that God's encounter with suffering is a transformative experience both for God and us, that he calls the theology of Christ the Christian view of God. If Christ is the revelation of God, it means that God is revealed not only in deity, but in suffering, humility, and pain. Those are the scandal of the cross. So often we try to protect God from all these experiences while on a completely different side, separated, we say, yes, Jesus experienced the cross. We've created this division in our theology, this separation. Rather than being coherent, we have these two separate things. Well, Woltman says we can't divide those two elements. Jesus is suffering as God, brought an experience into the experiences of God as his participation in the world. Of course, it's supposed to be scandalous. That's what Paul says. So often we've, we've tamed the experience of the cross and said, oh, it's this nice religious statement. Paul says it's a scandal. It's foolishness. This is why we don't want God to encounter his identity in the experiences of suffering, humility, and pain. For the original hearers, that was unheard of. That would be denying God's godness. And later writers want to protect God's godness, whereas God doesn't seem that need and is willing to enter into these experiences as part of his mission. Now, what is God's mission then in light of that? So we can speak of, in a certain sense, the death of God. The cross is first a statement about God, not only and perhaps not even primarily of the salvation of humanity. It's God's gesture. It's God's entering into this new reality. God forsakenness then stands at the center of the theology. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus cries from the cross. But of course, we have to be careful how to speak of the death of God. God doesn't die. We don't find the Trinity descending into death. But rather, we say that there is death in God. Just as Jesus is a person in the Trinity, we say Jesus is death, now enters into the Trinity. Whoa, but what do we do with that then? How do we conceive of that? That's the challenge. But what we can do is turn this around and show that if suffering, if death, if injustice itself is incorporated into this experience of God, where was God in Auschwitz? That was a key question for those in the mid 20th century. If we can't speak of God after Auschwitz, we shouldn't even, we, we have nothing more to say. If Christianity can't come to terms with these experiences of suffering, then we need to you know, pack up and move on. But of course, Christianity can, and Moltmann is among those trying to find this renewed voice that reflects the earliest teachings. What we know about the cross is the cross and is the experience of solidarity with the victims of suffering and torture. Where was God in Auschwitz? Moltmann's answer, he was in Auschwitz. He was suffering with them. Where is God in suffering? God suffers with us. Son of God died for two reasons, we say. For our atonement and entering into our experiences and dying for our sins, he creates a renewed relationship with God expressed in trust and obedience and salvation so that in trusting in this, we have unity with God that is impossible to do on our own. We also know it's for the sake of solidarity. Jesus is there is into this suffering as a way of saying, I am with you. I have not abandoned you. Why is this important? Because if Jesus is able to enter into death, bring the experience of death into God, then where is God absent? 
where can God be found? Everywhere. We'll talk more about this when we come back to the discussion of the focus on the Christ, on the cross. We also know that if death and suffering are something Jesus encounters, he doesn't leave the story there. We know that this is this is not where the story ends. So we talk about Jesus' life in light of the resurrection. Knowing how this turns out, we can think about suffering in a unique way. We say, yes, it's horrible. Yes, it's awful. Yes, death is something that causes even Jesus to weep. And Jesus is there with us, and thus he brings his story with him. If he is in solidarity with us in death, we are in solidarity with him in life. So the church is called to follow this example, to live in solidarity with the suffering and injustice, not so that it can just be caught in this, but it's so it can give hope in the midst of this, so it can point the way to life, so it can provide direction and insight and even physical help because Jesus did heal. So following the example of Christ is entering into these places, not being separated and divided and letting the sinners off to themselves. No, it's entering into us, taking on the solidarity of Christ so that we share the future we have with Christ with those who may see no other future. The hope of resurrection is thus definitive. The theology of cross only makes sense with the hope of resurrection. We speak of the death of the risen Christ or the resurrection of the crucified Christ. He writes, the theology of the cross is nothing, nothing other than the reverse side of the Christian theology of hope. If this has its point of departure in the resurrection of the one who was crucified, the theology of hope itself was, as may be seen therein, already being developed into an eschatological crucis. The theology of hope is set up by the resurrection of the one who was crucified, an eschatology of the cross. It's a paradox. Yet God, in his encounter, brings crucifixion from the ultimate destruction into a eschatological future, a hope, a promise that suffering is not the end. At the cross, there is a dialectic of death and life, despair and hope, darkness and life. So it's thus Christian hope is a realistic hope. It's not a utopia that if we do everything right, it's a hope that is based on the cross, the natural result of pushing against the systems of the world and the resurrection, the intended action of God's intervention in this world in a new way, bringing life where there was no hope. Now this expands then. This resurrection life is a new beginning. The cosmic rule of Christ, which offers it, brings into a holistic and cosmic Christology. So he critiques liberal Protestantism for a reductionistic tendency. Since Jesus was regarded merely as a human teacher with ethical inspiration, theology lost sight of its cosmic dimensions. It gave an ethical guide, but it didn't give hope that it was it, any of this wor was worth it. it. It makes an idealized humanity rather than putting the emphasis on God's salvation and thus finding the hope not in our own potential, not in our own tendency to do good, not in our own ability to learn from mistakes. Have you read history? Humans tend to not do that. But in looking at the cosmic dimensions, it orients the hope in God's intervention and call. In early Christian tradition, there was the acknowledgement of this cosmic role of Christ. This is important for the earliest Christians because it's only having this cosmic role that we have the, an ability to see beyond our current experiences and beyond what, the, what seems possible. This is true in the New Testament theology, like Colossians 1, and in patristic theology, particularly in Irenaeus and other Eastern fathers, whose encounter with suffering was very real, both in knowing those who had been persecuted and martyred and in being martyred themselves. These, this was not a theoretical ivory tower discussion. They were fi able to find hope and preach hope to those in the churches only by orienting the discussion in light of God's bigger intervention and transformation of the world. It's not a pie in the sky only future thing, but neither is it a only immediate ethical, religious -y, cultic kind of thing where you do your acts and hope for something better in the God. No, it's you need both sides. The present is transformed by the future. The future has an ontology that actually gives meaning to the present so that in living in light of what we know to be true about the future, we can live in a new way. That is a theology of hope. The cosmic rule of Christ tells us that the hope for new creation is not only eschatological future driven. It is that. But hope for new creation relates to the future of our own world and planet. We are more embedded in the present because we know that what is present has real meaning for God, real love by God. God's investment in this world was so important that he sent the Son, so that because he loved the whole world, he wants to bring hope to it. 
so we can talk about the salvation of the whole cosmos. And it's our interactions with it then that are shaped by our connection with God. Do we love the world? That is an important question because it changes the issue between what does the world need or what is salvation and how how is it that we can point people to salvation to a divine perspective? Because in the past, in especially in fundamentalist and even early evangelicals, there was this tendency to reject social action and social involvement and participation in helping this world because the thought was, well, it's all going to burn and go away. Why should we do it? But what people need is salvation. Well, that's a very rules-oriented, how can we fix this kind of way, but it's not a loving relationship. If we love the world as God loves the world, how do we respond to those around us? Not like a salesman, not like a, someone who hands out the tickets, or a supervisor who, if everyone performs right, will give them way. No, we love them. We do good because we love them. We participate in this world in a way that expresses our love to the world, our love for God in respecting and honoring what God has created, what God loves, what God calls good. There's not a need for an added theological perspective beyond the expression of how do you respond to something that you love? How do you respond to someone you love? So this brings in an ecological theology. How do we respond in light of this world, oriented in love, oriented out of God's redemptive work for this world? This is important because after Chernobyl, how do we talk about Christian activity in light of the fact that we can destroy the world and cause significant ecological disaster? whether in single instances or in small development of all of millions and millions of people slowly adding environmental disasters. This brings Moltmann into a more post-modern approach. Rather than seeing the binary save, not save, now or then, Moltmann enters into the complexity of trying to find a vision for the world that's complex. That's how do we get along with the world? It's not us against the world. It's not the world against us. It's us with this world that God so loves. So Christian hope also leads to liberation and work for the world. The hope for the world is not only for eternity, but for this life. Eternity enters into this life even now. With the resurrection, eternity breaks into our experience of history. So which one do we live in? If we are only living for something later, then we're not living in where eternity is now. If we're only living for now, we're not entering into where eternity is later. We're, we're segmenting eternity in a way that eternity, being eternity, cannot actually be segmented. And so we speak of the eschatological coming of God, the idea that God is doing this big picture, <laughs> as big as can be, from creation to the end of our experience of time, just as we see Jesus entering into this world and then resurrecting this hope that brings something out of nothing, so too God brings something out of nothing in creation, brings something out of nothing in the eschatological recreation. Christian theology then, and, and Christology in particular, looks forward to this promised day when Christ will make all things new. That is the Christian promise. The new heavens and a new earth. To physicalized resurrection, there is no sense of a disembodied reality. Yes, flesh will be different. Jesus' resurrected body was of a different kind of new reality than what we're experiencing now. But it's physical. So when we say Jesus doesn't have flesh in eternity, it's not saying Jesus is somehow this floaty thing. It's, it, it's more saying that the ability to encounter eternity in a physicalized form is different than, than our current experience of what that means. He develops his eschatology most fully in his work, The Coming of God, published in 1996, which speaks of the God coming to renew creation and find his dwelling place in the renewed creation. While eschatology is outside the scope of this particular class, I encourage you to read this if you have an interest in eschatology. It's very different than how the conventional church discussions take it. And in his interactions with science, with discussions of time, with the broad range of the Christian tradition, Moltmann provides a holistic, very biblically well-rounded 
proposal that really brings eschatology into our current experience and makes eschatology inseparable from eschatology. This is the continuing coherent mission of God that has integrity with what God has done before, integrity with Jesus' encounter in this world, integrity then with also our lives and our ministry in whatever context we find ourselves. Eschatology can have a meaningful impact with how we relate to those around us and be a message of hope if it's truly to be a biblical eschatology and if it's truly to be a biblical eschatology it has to be oriented in a coherent christology Moltmann moves steadily towards a trinitarian panentheism in which the triune god and the world condition each other god is not the world the world is not God, so we're not talking about pantheism, but God is the source of the world. God's presence in the world gives life. God's continued interaction with the world sustains and orients the world. So God is the main player, and God has committed himself in the promise, in the covenant, to this world. Whether or not we think it's a good idea or not, whether we think this is the kind of thing God should do, God has committed himself because he had said he would. His name now, as the God of promise is connected with his promise to bring redemption and hope to this world. Moltmann's approach to panentheism is a little different than what we find in process or even some of the uh, open the theisms uh, where he's he having drawn such distinct understanding of God in each of the persons and having really built a system that has each particular person fully developed and a fully developed Trinitarian theology in unity and diversity. He allows God to interact in this world without God's own nature as God being somehow vulnerable in a negative sense. God's vulnerability comes out of God's personal investment, but he's not ontologically vulnerable. That's where the difference is. His being isn't vulnerable to the world, but God's relational interaction is connected to this world, and God's presence in this world is affected by what happens. It's a it's an important nuance, as you will, you often hear people talking about Moltmann's approach and and lumping that with process theologians who make God's very being dependent on the world. So some lessons from his Christology. It's very dynamic. It's interactive. It's not just these these themes about judicial interaction or forensic salvation or these these ideas that that are out of reach be from uh, most people's thoughts. As long as they decide on the dotted line, they're good. No, it's a it's a it's a Christology that has a living interaction with this world, a, a Christology that that draws from the stories and narrative and developments. The trajectory of Christology has a living interaction with the world, just as, just as Jesus had a living interaction with this world. It's also a concrete Christology. It's based on the history of Jesus who lived in a real place at a real time and spoke to real people and did real actions. It's not a utopian vision of the possibilities of human existence and what Jesus' resurrection means is that we can become fulfilled as well. No. It's a real action of transformation. Jesus was dead, and then Jesus is alive. That is not utopian. That is a fact of God's intervention that changes real circumstances in real moments of history. So we see in all this the importance of Jesus's earthly life. How Jesus interacted with people is not extraneous. It's not just trivia. It gives us insight into how God is interacting, what God values, how God is willing to invest himself, how God interacts with people of power, with structures, with systems of sin, go down the list. We draw meaning, we draw theology from the life because that is intentional about how God wanted to work in Jesus's mission and intentional for how the gospel writers themselves knew this mission to be. So they wrote the gospels as a way of conveying the gospel. We also know the importance of the Holy Spirit Spirit in this Christology, the connection of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't that, this, that the Spirit filled Jesus and made him God. It wasn't that the Spirit was sort of was the the manager behind this uh, uh, remote interaction. No, there there there's a dynamic interaction between the Spirit and the Son empowering and enlivening and just as their unity in the Trinity we say is inseparable, so too this is this is a uh, coherent work together but we can't divide them because in order to go forward and understand the mission of christ onward we see that the spirit who does this work in jesus continues to do the same work 
And this work in Jesus has a social and political relevance. It's not just about some future thing. There's an immediacy that brings transformation. We are to live in a new way. And it doesn't mean partisan, like we take sides so that we can give other people, groups of people power over and against another group. We, if we are walking in the way of Christ, we are partisans for Jesus. And as we know from the cross, as, as we'll talk in more depth, Jesus offended every side. He didn't live up to what any side, one of them, but he offered his own way. And that had an immediate reality. So there's a dynamic tension between hope, what we know is true, and work. The experiences of trying to put this into practice, feeling the discouragement of that. And if we lose sight of either side, we undermine what we have. If we lose sight of hope, we, we get panicked in the work. We become discouraged and then we try to work in this world in a way that is not what Jesus called us to and end up doing that causing more problems. Welcome to church history. And impatience, as the writer Alan Kreider said, was the primary betrayal of the Christian vision from the earliest centuries. They were patient and in living in the call of Christ in the way that Christ and scripture orients. It didn't have as fast results as many would like, but it created a ferment in society that brought vast and deep change. Whereas once the church became impatient and said, we have to do all these things right now, immediately, they created just as many problems as they solved. We have this con great conversion, but it, it ended up being less thorough. And you have then reintroduction of how people are valued or disvalued, reintroduction of violence and, and control and power that, that then create a separation, which is why we're now in what's called a post-Christendom. So we need this dynamic tension, our work being informed by our hope and our hope being informed by our constant activity in order to find this vision of Christ in our current experiences. So there's a wider context of the cross and the resurrection. It's not just individual salvation. Jesus didn't die for me, whatever else he does. Jesus died as a way of interacting with this world in the life of God who expresses his love for God in incorporating even that very definition of where God can be not can't be, he incorporates even death. So the spirit of life brings life to that which God can experience, and in doing that, God can enter into every experience. Transforming my life, offering me salvation, yes, but not me alone, gathering me together in a community, and gathering me in this life, the, if life is only comes through this work of Christ and spirit into a restored relation with the Father, I can't enter into this life in isolation and say, yay me, now I can go off and do what I want. I'm drawn into the life of community with others and with God. That is the eternal vision. That's the hope we have. He's not without its challenges. The incarnation for Moltmann seems to initiate new experiences of God that we don't want to get caught in discussions of time, but can we really talk about God's experiencing something new? That's the question. How much of the incarnation can be said to be not only doing a new thing in salvation history, but also something new in God? If God is God, can there be something new introduced to God that makes God more God? Huh. That raises some tricky questions that then pushes us back into theology proper, the doctrine of God. What about the sin and fall as the occasion for the re resurrection? Now, some critique Moltmann for not talking a lot about sin. And if you read his books, it's pretty clear that that's not a major focus. That Some say that's a decisive critique because of the cross and the fall or anything, it's an occasion of sin. Moltmann himself has responded to this and said he doesn't talk about sin, not because it's not important, but because other people have talked about that so much and he doesn't have anything new to add to those discussions. When he talks about his series called Contributions to Theology, He's not intending to write this vast systematic theology that says everything about everything that he possibly could. He's highlighting certain themes and elements that he feels has been left out of the discussion. And for him, as he says, it's, it's extraneous for a German of his age to talk about sin and guilt because they're so self-evident following World War II. What he needed to say to people who were so confronted with their sin and guilt, he said, we need a message of hope. So he talks about cross in a way of talking to those who are suffering in the midst of Auschwitz or other crises. He talks about the resurrection as a way of hope for saying there's hope to people even if they've been these horrible people, there's God has reached out to you. So the suffering and those who cause suffering can each have hope, not without justice being done, but as a way of renewing community.
That's the promise. The oppressed and the oppressors all find this renewed promise on the cross. So the oppressed are freed from their oppression and the oppressors are freed from their oppressing and can able to find a reconciliation of community that extends into eternity precisely because of this work of Jesus. The danger of panentheism is God made too dependent on the world. This is another key question and, and one that I've become comfortable with with Moltmann as a way of sorting out how I, I read his works, but it's very easy to read his works and see there might be too much of an interaction. God is, it's, there's a fine line between God interacting and God being ontologically vulnerable, which is what you fall in process, the process theology side. I wouldn't want to go to God's being, being vulnerable, but there is a certain sense that love is interactive and expressive in giving and taking. But he hasn't clarified this as well as some can ideally want. So this goes back to the limitations of his contributions. They do not and do not purport to say all there is or should be said, as I said. He's not presenting a systematic theology. So it's a lot of topics that he's proposing, but this is both the, a, a encouragement of if you have a critique, it's not absolute, but at the same time, he doesn't clarify things, so leaves things unsaid that probably he should have addressed in order to better clarify the things he does said. So what he actually believes on certain topics is left out unless you read very deeply or broadly, or as I did one fine afternoon, I was able to ask some key questions that I had about his works. And if he, he, he is very helpful in responding. It's not that he hasn't thought about these. It's that he's not writing on them. And so things left unsaid may or may not be as essential for him, but may be more essential for us in light of our questions. So he's not contributing a final project that then we say, here's the package of all we need to think about theology. That's not even his goal. His goal is not to have Moltmannians wandering around who take his system and then incorporate it. His goal is to provoke questions, to build on those who have gone before, to lead theology into new directions and new proposals and insights and questions. And he even says this, his, he, he has a tendency to intentionally push the boundaries, to provoke conversation. He actually seems to delight in critique and response rather than just everyone saying, you know, yeah, yeah. He actually, he responds better to pushback and deeper interaction because he wants to deepen the conversation so that above all there is integrity with this world in light of what we're experiencing and coherence with the bigger picture world but his focus is more on the integrity christianity has to mean something christianity has to have integrity with our experiences of this world or it's not an incarnated theology which of course is the core testimony of christian belief